We're going to be talking about a new streaming show, Unicorn Hunters, where judges and even viewers get to invest in prospective companies. Joining me now are three stars of the program, Steve Wozniak, who many of you know as the co-founder of Apple. Entrepreneur Sylvina Moschini, who is also an executive producer of the show, and attorney and political advisor Mo Bella, who is also co creator of the program. We welcome all three of you to Washington Post Live. Thank you. Hi, Lucky. Very nice to connect. Yeah. Hi, Steve and Mo. Nice Hi, to Sylvina. see you all. Uh, Sylvina. Hi, Mo. <laughs> Hi, Walter. I know. It's like a Zoom conference call between all of us, right? <laughs> You're bringing us back together. We haven't been together since we were on set. So thank you happy for bringing us back together. Happy to do so. Uh, Sylvina, let's begin with you. Explain to viewers who may not have seen the show yet how it plays out. Hi, Lahi. It's a show that brings together two main two concepts. One is entertainment. We want to make it engaging for people. And the other concept is making uh, them uh, able to have the opportunity to uh, become richer potentially by investing in these these companies so we, we wanted to democratize the access to investment opportunity for the masses and i was lucky enough as uh, one of the executive producers of the show to have a stellar panel that helped me to judge these opportunities and bring them to to the masses through the show and Steve, what exactly is a unicorn in business parlance? Uh, a unicorn is a company that reaches a billion dollar valuation. So, you know, that's sort of like the modern level of big success. Well, let's give our audience a flavor of Unicorn Hunters with a clip where a contestant is making his case to potential investors. Let's take a look. So I'm here, you sold 750 scanners. Yes, over how much time and what did that gross you? So we started the sales uh, after setting up our production facility and after FDA clearance. We now have clearance in 10 markets and these sales have been made over the last three years. What's the total sales? We've uh, sold products worth three and a half million so far. You mentioned that your product is cleared in 10 different markets. Yes. Can you tell us the major markets it's cleared in? Sure. So Ibrist is commercially available right now and through the regulatory process in Mexico, India, Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, Botswana, Oman, United States, Europe, uh, and... Okay, it would be short if I ask whether it's not cleared. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. What do they sell for each? So iBreast exam is designed intelligently to provide access to early detection and not just equipment. The scanner retails for about $5,000, but it often is bundled in uh, along with the purchase of many of these cartridges. This sensor has 648 capacitive sensors that can measure tissue elasticity in real time. We preload these sensor cartridges, much like a printer ink cartridge with 100 or 500 scans. And how much is the cost to the doctor's office and then ultimately to the woman? So uh, the eye breast exam to the woman would cost somewhere between $7 to $15. Mm. So the price of a Starbucks latte. Yeah. Exactly. We yeah. want this to be at a fraction of the cost of other medical tests. Wow. wow. And so we saw there uh, the contestant making his case to the circle of money. Um, I'd love to ask all three of you, and let's start with Mo. What factors do you weigh when deciding whether to invest uh, in a particular company? You know, thanks for the question, because this is kind of a really beautiful aspect of investing, right? And as we try to open up the investment ecosystem, I'm glad you asked this question, because anybody listening or any of our viewers around the world, I want them to know that it's a very personal, individual decision. And so uh, we respect that. We respect each other. I personally... I tend to be very people oriented. So to me, it's not as much as looking at numbers. Of course, I consider the PL, their balance sheet, all of the typical business criteria. But for me, frankly, it comes down at the end. My decision is based on the passion of the person, their ability to lead effectively, uh, their ability to communicate effectively. 
uh, so that they can grow their business. So to me, it's about people. So, Dina, well, like, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I will agree with, with Ma, of course, at the end of the day, it's all about the people. The companies that are in the show has been a vetted, has been recommended by partners like Google, like Impulsa, the Innovation Hub of the Government of Colombia, by Microsoft, by startups, and has gone through a very comprehensive due diligence process. So the business aspects are covered. Uh, for me, in addition to the people, it's about the impact. We are looking for companies that can leave the world a better place than we found it. And uh, finding entrepreneurs that have a mission, have a vision, and want to build something that improve people's lives, improve the planet, create jobs, uh, find a solution for diseases, and bring uh, solutions for giving all of us a much more inclusive and a uh, better work environment is one of the drivers uh, uh, that I wait on the decision making process. And Steve? Well, I agree with both of those. I, I usually am a bit more skeptical thinking about alternatives and trying to be sure because you can be sold anything on the internet, you know, smart people can, can be. And, um, you know, but uh, pretty much, you know, does it seem to me like it'll be able like engineering wise to be created and manufactured often the products are in the health field and it's hard to say does it do the same job as what it's replacing it might be much less costly than something else but only do a part of the job so i'm always thinking this way what are the what are the gotchas maybe and steve uh for those who are watching and might be thinking this sounds a lot like shark tank how is this program different well, this program is actually not, we are the investors thinking of making big pitch investments, you know, whether it's funded by producers or whatever, but we're just, we're putting the, sh the show out to the audience, you know, a vast audience of normal people. And they don't normally get to hear these real startup pitches. I mean, I've been on both sides of it and uh, very intriguing to hear if something doesn't even exist yet and, you know, might come to be and might change things and you get to decide for yourself. We worry very much that people would, oh my gosh, you know, be overly sold and invest more than they can because they're normal people. They're not sophisticated in, you know, investment banks and that sort of thing. Um, but I like the fact that it's just out there to the world. Come on, here's, you know, here's how you can invest too. And these, these pitch things, there's just so many of them and very few get heard except the pitchers usually go to a VC, the next VC, the next VC, go to all the normal, um, you know, funds and whatever, trying to get funded. And now they're actually going out to like normal people to see what it's like. How does, how do little companies start from zero? If I could just add to that for one second, if you don't mind, uh, yeah, of course. because Steve, Steve, Steve is spot on, obviously. Uh, but the other big difference in my eyes, and I just wanted to share this with your listeners um, or viewers, I should say, um, is that we create access at Shark Tank. It's five people or whatever the number is that are just, we're watching them just get richer because they're the only ones that can invest, right? So to me, the driving force, the vibe, the heart, the soul, the pulse of Unicorn Hunters, which is different than anybody else, is that we are creating access. Access for the, inno the innovative entrepreneur because they have a chance to pitch the world with their startup and their emerging growth company. So they have the chance to pitch the world as our investors and access to potential investors that's unprecedented. This is the waitress in Bogota, Colombia, the waiter in Singapore, the teacher in Kansas City, the doctor in New York City. It doesn't matter your country code, your zip code, your area code, your, the color of your skin, your gender, nothing matters at our show. Everybody has equal access to wealth creation and that those in my eyes are the biggest differentiators to anybody else and as you know it's uh sorry it's entrepreneurs we can as a woman entrepreneur i will uh, also emphasize how important it is for diverse founders to have the same opportunities that the founders that are based in silicon valley have i'm a women entrepreneur and only 0.4 of all the vc money goes to latin founders who are women. So 
this show is about making people uh, equally uh, able to make a difference in their life economically by investing in perhaps the next Apple, but also giving entrepreneurs that are women, that are diverse from the LGTB community, black founders, international founders, the opportunity to get the money that they need to make their dreams a reality by partnering up with people who can also will have at the same time the opportunity to become potentially millionaires because we believe that different from other shows, we bring the interactive component that can enable people to become richer, to have the opportunity to co with entrepreneurs. And we do believe that the world needs more millionaires, not more billionaires. So anyone in the world can invest and support these amazing entrepreneurs from all over the world that are building the next leading company and co-building with them. So that makes a real difference. And for me, it's extremely personal because as the female founder, I came up also with the opportunity to democratize the access by experiencing the same challenge myself. So we raised money and our company became a billion dollar businesses by partnering up with the people out there who believe in our dream and join us in co-building this. So it came from a very personal standpoint. And we want to take this with Steve, with Mo, with Rossi, with Lance, with Alex, to the people so they can partner in building up the next company that will lead hopefully as Steve did the world and transform the industry. Yeah, so lest we forget the lest we forget the biggest difference also is that we have the co-founder of the most impactful company in the history of the world, the Waz, on our show. So let's not forget oh, we um, have the... For what more? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's a big selling point. Um, actually, Sylvina, can you speak to the level of investment viewers have made? What is the average investment that a viewer has made? The viewers can invest starting at $1,000. And we found out that this is the type of disposable income that many people will have. And as you know, like, like a lot of people go to Las Vegas, gamble and uh, invest or uh, gamble on, on, on money that uh, without having like a perspective of the impact that they are making. So we try to uh, come up with a number that will make sense for the people, but will also at a scale help uh, the entrepreneurs access money. We raised $50 million for our company and we do believe that while expanding the audience, we can help entrepreneurs raise from 20 to $200 million when we have full distributions. And so far in the first uh, half of the first season of our show, we have over $60 million in commitment for investment for the companies that we represent in the show. And we are just starting. So we do believe and we are confident that they can reach a large amount by bringing anyone as partners in the company and enable them to invest in their success and the success of everyone as well. And, and Mo, you've talked before about how there's an inequity on the investor side against the average middle class potential investor. Um, do these small time investors have access to enough information to make a responsible financial commitment? Well, we, we believe that they do. Uh, the key here is to remind everybody listening, and we do this on the show to our global audience as well. Silvina mentioned Las Vegas. There is a risk in crossing the street. There is a risk in driving your car, and there is a risk in investing. And so we make sure people are very aware that this is not a risk-free endeavor. Uh, however, we do, to answer your question, we feel like there is plenty of information provided by the companies that are pitching on our show. If you're interested in investing in them, for example, you click on a link and it'll take you to their PPM. It'll take you to all the information that they provide potential investors. You've got to do your homework. You've got to do your research. You've got to do your due diligence. We've done a lot for you already, but you still have to do your own on top of that. So there is plenty of information necessary to make an informed decision. And touching on what Mo says, we are not only presenting unique opportunities to the viewing public, but we're also protecting them as best we can, you know, with our own on-show um, questions and answers and whatnot. Yes, like, and, yeah, and also we're launching an academy. As 
well. Very soon we are following up with you and women because uh, we also want to have more women investing and women traditionally don't, do not invest because they don't know how to do it. So we are launching an academy to educate people on what are the risks, what are the things that they need to consider when investing in pre-IPO stock in companies at the growth stage. But the companies that we present in the show has been carefully selected. There, is, there are no guarantees in life but they have gone through due diligence process, uh, received money from institutional investors that have uh, done a comprehensive research and our team also reviewed them. But that doesn't mean that there is certainty because as you know, only certainties in life are debt and taxes, but we try to educate and give people the tools that they need to understand if this investment is right for them and try to provide all the information from our end with our own analysis, because we also decide to invest or not. Sometimes we invest, sometimes we don't. We don't all invest for the same reason. And um, also the tools through the information on the PPM, the private placement memorandum, and the educational tips and uh, insight that they need to consider to make the decision. And of course, when you do investment, as you know, it's always a numbers game. So we recommend that they invest small and that they diversify their portfolio because in the number, they may be the chance in which one company will make it big and balance out for some others that perhaps didn't make it so big. So the risk is reduced. These are techniques that all investors make and we wanna bring them through education to the people as well. Um, Steve, uh, I'm wondering if you can think back to 1976 when you and Steve Jobs uh, founded Apple. If you were on Unicorn Hunters then, how would you have pitched your idea to the Circle of Money panelists? Oh, we would have pitched that we had a product that was five years ahead of the rest of the world and what they were trying and that this was going to be a future. And, you know, it's a, it's a question because even big analysts back then we're very questionable. Is this going to be worth anything? All the big computer companies said no. Uh, Hewlett Packard, where I worked, turned me down five times for the personal computer. Uh, you know, so it was so it's it's difficult. But um, we still would have pitched it just the way we did. We actually found an angel, listened to our story, thought about it, analyzed it. He had a lot of business success in his life and saw that this might be one of those real big opportunities. You know, uh, but can I just add to that? Because Steve said something on one of our shows that two things that have impacted my life so greatly, honestly. Um, one thing Steve said was that if Unicorn Hunters existed when he and Mr. Jobs were creating Apple, they would have come to Unicorn Hunters. That's incredible. <laughs> That's incredibly inspiring to us. The second thing that uh, if you watch the show, uh, I, the other day I said in a speech in Dubai, uh, I never dream I'd say to an audience, you can binge watch me. That's an amazing statement, right? But if you binge watch our show, you'll see I invest in every single one so far. And it's because I call it the, the Waz rule. Because when Steve and Steve were out trying to raise money, people turned them down. And I don't want to risk turning down the next Steve Wozniak. So I try to invest in everyone if I feel that there's, you know, there's potential but I call it the Waz rule. I don't want to be that one person that said no to the to the next Wozniak. Yeah, and yeah, I, have startup now. I have a startup now, and boy, I mean, Unicorn Hunters would be really good for us, except that we are sort of well-connected already to, you know, the funding wing, but could show up there, except it'd also be a conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that small thing, <laughs> you'd be pitching to your own circle. <laughs> I will invest in him for sure. I was going to say the same thing, Sabinita. I'll, I'm in, Was. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, can you just speak to the, you know, you said you wish a show like, like yours was around, Steve, when you were starting Apple. How would that have changed your investor mix and the kind of investors that you did attract? I, I think we would have uh, actually attracted about the same amount of money or more. Uh, I think we'd have been, you know, well on our way. Basically, we needed, we had zero money, no bank accounts, no rich relatives. We just had to raise enough to build a thousand computers. Little tiny start is our story that this is really going to become something, you know, big and payback, you know, good enough. I, I believe we'd have been very successful at Unicorn Hunters. That we had something so unique. I mean, you know what? Think about arcade games, big part of our life now, right? They were just started by Atari in Los Gatos, California back then. 
Well, uh, our, our computer was the first time ever that arcade games were color instead of black and white. First time ever arcade games were software where a nine-year-old kid could write a good game in one day instead of a skilled engineer with a thousand wires trying to fi figure it out for half a year to a year. Oh no, I think we'd have had a really good story that a lot of people would have uh, seen the value of. Actually, a lot of people would have wanted this product and that's the most important thing. It's kind of when you want something yourself, you know what's good and what's not. Yeah, let's show another clip from the show, uh, Unicorn Hunters, because I think it shows where um, judges, you know, you're talking about how impressed you are with the ingenuity of many of the contestants uh, with their business ideas. Uh, let's take a look. I'm amazed at how many companies there are out there that have starting ideas that really can become unicorns that really are doing that amazing things in the world. Right. And I really feel good for our viewing audience. They are going to find some great investments. Yeah. What I've really learned is how important diversity is in investment. It is so important to have all kinds of walks of life within a company because everyone has their own perspective. So to have a company that is full of diversity, I think is just so, so important these days. Well, even among our own ideas, we have a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. That yeah. works well. So Steve, uh, what advice would you give to someone coming on the show trying to gin up enough excitement uh, for their idea? Well, most importantly, be um, able to communicate that you have a lot of passion, you really come from caring about something, and don't put it just in uh, you know boring financial terms only. Um, you know, and, and let people understand what it really is. Uh, and, and you know what, it's a small amount of time. You could think of, you know, 40 hours of talking to different groups, trying to raise money and you just come on the show for, you know, one hour, maybe half an hour, a part of one. And it's a small, so just, so be well prepared and come across like you're very confident. Um, if every answer that gets asked by the circle of money, you have an instant answer. It looks very good. Like you really understand the operations of your, your startup company. Um, Selena, the show premiered in May, streaming on Amazon Prime. What's the viewership been like and what's the best way for people to watch? There are many different ways to um, for people to access the, the show. One is say, through our website, unicornhunter.com. They can see the currently streaming shows and they can also see past episodes because we really believe that multi-screen gives people the opportunity to actually access the content anytime, anytime they want. But also we stream it through LinkedIn and the viewership has been spectacular. We only been uh, out for a few months and we reached 5 million views in the latest episodes. So that means that we are at the same level as a shark and with 10 years in, in the market. And the most important thing is that we have people from all over the world. Now we are working on partnerships with media companies from Mexico to Argentina to Europe, uh, UK and, and the US. So the people that will have the opportunity to watch the show will be amplified exponentially because we are co-building with these media partners the uh, opportunity to bring these startups to their audiences and give them the chance to invest in them. So it's super exciting. It has been and very, very exciting and an amazing journey for, for us building this new category, which is like, you know, the script games, but with an impact, with the ability to change people's life, both entrepreneurs and investors, making interactive also, it's also, also found on YouTube. I think we need to mention that because that is a very uh, central place where people are watching it. Uh, we're getting, as Sylvina mentioned, multiple millions of viewers, unique viewers per episode now. Uh, and uh, we're humbled and we're proud uh, and excited about that. Yeah, and while I have this amazing panel assembled, I do want to ask a few other questions unrelated to the show, but related to your areas of expertise. Um, Steve, you recently voiced support for Bitcoin. You've called it mathematical purity as opposed to the artificial US dollar. What do you see as the future of cryptocurrencies? Uh, I feel very strongly about some of them, like Bitcoin, but I also see there's an awful lot of like snake salesmen. We'll start up a new coin like all the others and get a celebrity name attached and try to sell a lot of people on it. And they often go to zero and the, the people who started it maybe cash out and make a lot of money. And I don't like that. 
And Selena, you've been a very successful entrepreneur. Um, we're looking at the global economy. It's expected to grow 6% this year, 4.5% next year. Pretty good numbers given the pandemic. How would you evaluate where the world's economy is headed? Well, I do believe that, as the Chinese says, crises bring along opportunities, and we cannot think of a deepest and a stronger crisis than the one that we are uh, getting, hopefully, uh, soon out as the pandemic. So the pandemic transformed the world. We are living a perfect storm for digital transformation, and I'm very, very optimistic that through entrepreneurship, through new ideas, and through digital, we can help governments and uh, entrepreneurs And uh, Mo, you worked in several presidential administrations, um, including very closely with then Vice President Biden. Uh, what is the main thing or what is one of the big things that you learned from the world of politics that's applicable to the world of finance? Oh, very good. The great question, actually. Um, the, the interesting thing that I've learned is that the same principles and the same kind of strategic thinking apply in both sectors. And I think a lot of people think they're very different, but they actually they're not. If you you think about it operationally from a management perspective, an executive leadership perspective, branding, marketing, communications, operations, all of these things are the same, whether it's public sector or private sector. And so what I've learned is uh, to stay true to your values uh, as a leader, as a, as a manager, uh, and frankly, it sounds cliche, but it's not because this is what we do on the show as well. We treat people with respect, with decency, with dignity. We affirm, we celebrate, we honor. And and I do that in politics and I do that in business. And, uh, you know, my mama's probably watching, so hopefully she's proud. <laughs> and then, Steve, you shared some thoughts recently on the new iPhone 13. You've said you can't tell the difference between it and other iPhones. Um, what do you think, you, what would you have done differently? And do you think Apple has remained innovative under Tim Cook? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think every, every, um, every upgrade of every technical product from every company is just like, um, there's very seldom there's like a real major change. And my life doesn't change, but going from iPhone 12 to iPhone 13, uh, some people will say, oh, but my gosh, you can, you have more memory to store um, more videos. You have uh, um, three to three X zoom instead of two X zoom. And yeah, and that, those are, those are fact, but I kind of think I'm just like a normal person, you know, and most people don't really get into those, the tiny little differences. They just want, well, does it take pictures? <laughs> Good to know that I <laughs> treat my iPhone the way Steve Wozniak treats his iPhone. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time and we will have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today, Steve Wozniak, Sylvina Moschini, and Mo Vella. Thank you to the Washington Post. Great partner.